So welcome, everyone. I make that pretty much time. I know a few folks are filtering in, but do take your seats. There's plenty of uh, room up front. Don't be afraid. Uh, so I'll introduce myself in a second, but I did want to uh, start the talk today testing cloud apps with some high-level key takeaways, the TLDRs. So what I'm going to say today is the inner dev test loop can be painful with microservices and Kubernetes. Microservices tends to mean there's just more things there. Kubernetes, as much as I love Kubernetes, there's more layers involved in the stack. File stack, uh, the containers, the networking stack, these things. In my experience, I found the pain increases with the number of services you develop. Sounds kind of obvious, right? But there is a few key inflection points on the number of services where you're going to want to switch up your testing strategy. Between, say, five and 10 services and 50 plus, there's very different testing uh, strategies required at those points, in my experience. You have options. This is the high-level meta takeaway. Like The way I'm built, I just love learning stuff. right? I love sharing stuff. And I, early on in my career, I didn't fully grok how many things were out there, techniques, patterns, tools. And I made it sort of a mission based on feedback from my mentors to learn about these things. So know you have options when you are testing. There's mocking, service virtualization, uh, and we're also going to look at some remote, remote local tooling as well. Very briefly, uh, this is me at Daniel Bryant UK on most of the interwebs. 20 year, dare I say it, career in software development. Uh, started as a Java developer, bit of JavaScript, moved on to architecture, then ops, and then platform engineering. Wrote a couple of books along the way with my buddies. Shameless plug, I'm doing a book signing uh, Thursday. So if you want a free copy of Mastering API Architecture, come along to the O'Reilly booth on Thursday. Uh, I have worked with Ambassador Labs. I'm kind of repping them today, but I actually left them about a year ago. So I'm doing freelance work now. Some of the Sintaso folks I'm, I'm representing as well, doing work with them. Uh, but this is kind of an independent uh, talk today. Setting the scene. So most of the advice I'm going to give today is based around the idea you're building microservices that are running in a container. And who knows if we're really building microservices, some kind of small services, bounded contexts, good APIs, right? Um, I think the advice will apply to macro services maybe even the monolith, if we dare to build monoliths these days. But one of my favorite memes here is we are deploying onto Kubernetes, right? Now, I love Kubernetes. It is complicated, though, and it's got better over the years. But I still think it's not for the faint of heart. And as a developer by kind of trade, uh, I had to learn a lot about Kubernetes. And, and I definitely aged as I learned uh, Kubernetes, right? I'm also going to rep, uh, riff or talk a lot about this fantastic work by Toby Clemson. Uh, this is my gold standard. Can you believe it or not? It's 10 years old. Now, how many things in tech last 10 years, like a PCNR space, right? This is fantastic work by Toby, ex-thought worker, doing amazing stuff. I am going to use his definitions of unit testing, integration testing, testing communication paths uh, and the communication between systems or components. Component testing uh, talks about uh, subsystem testing, testing the functionality at the API level. And I'm going to mention end-to-end -end testing using Toby's definition. Sorry, I should have put the link up. There's the link, right? My bad. Uh, on the Martin Fowler blog. Uh, I am not going to talk about contract testing. I think it's super valuable. I have got blogs on Pact and using Spring Cloud Contract. If you want to know more, many other people do a better job at that than I do as well. Contract testing, very valuable. Couldn't fit it in within 25 minutes. To frame the discussion, so I do want to mention the inner and outer dev loop. A fantastic blog by Mitch Denny, unfortunately disappeared now, but you can find it online, and it's kind of common parlance these days. But in the inner dev loop, we're doing our test-driven development, we're building our systems, we're modeling the world we're trying to capture right, we're keeping that feedback loop super tight. Eventually, we push to the outer loop. This is where we do code reviews, more verification, security analysis, all that good stuff, right? CI, CD. Now, I think we can argue that the outer loop has kind of been captured by remote, and that's totally fine, right? We push stuff to GitHub, we build on Harness, we use Sevo to spin up Kubernetes clusters, totally cool with that. Now, I think the inner loop is still very much around the local space. Now, I'm going to shout out the Gitpod folks, Daytona, GitHub Code Spaces. There's a lot of folks doing remote uh, IDEs or cloud development environments. And I am bullish on that future. But at the moment, like I say, a lot of us are still around the local in this kind of experience. We're running stuff on our local machines. I think unit testing is primarily in the inner loop. Integration testing, primarily in the inner loop. You're knitting things together, right? 
component testing, end-to-end -end testing, more in that outer loop. But sometimes you do need to do it in the inner loop too. And there's a bit of a warning sign. If you're doing a lot of component testing locally, or you're, you want to like push a lot of stuff to remote to test it, they are warning signs, which I'll talk about more in a moment. One thing with service-oriented architectures, microservices in general, is there's just more stuff, right? Totally makes sense. And my inner loop can depend on your outer loop. I am, you've given me this new dependency, this new service. I've got no idea how it works. I look at the Swagger docs, the Open API docs, perhaps, async API. I get an idea, but I want to poke and prod that service. How do I do that? And it cascades through, too, as well, all right? So there's just more things with service-oriented architecture. I think a lot of us start mocking things and then running as much as we can locally. And this works, you know, pick your poison, right, how you want to run things locally. Like if you install it on your machine, uh, you can get quite far. Now, not every developer is happy, like, installing Docker and running Docker. That's something to bear in mind, too. But you can get pretty far with this approach. Coming from the JVM world, I think I can pretty much say after we get a certain number of services, this becomes quite tricky, shall we say, right? And my experience is like, it's only a few for a JV JVM or a CLR-based workload. Uh, with Go and other services, you can get a bit further, perhaps five, 10 services, but you can't run everything on your machine at some point. People then tend to do more mocking, and then they rely a lot more on component or end-to-end -end testing, right? Uh, again, pick your poison. These are some of the ones I've used along the way. Um, once you get to this space, there's a danger that the inner and outer loop can become the same. And I'm sure a few of you recognize, you're writing some code, you're building a container, you're pushing it to a registry, deploying it to a cluster, testing, made a mistake. And the loop begins again, right? And this can be quite slow. It reminds me of my old school days, sort of like compiling stuff and putting in print lines and then recompiling it and redeploying it. And my Java HTTP days, I was doing this with um, GSP pages, right? Like this really slow loop. Automation can help. Hat tip the scaffold folks. Garden, Gitcube, Octeto, Ksync, Tilt. There is many others too. But a lot of the time that these can help you automate some of that build and deploy of the Docker container in the background to a remote target. So you're not constantly on the CLI doing Docker build, Docker push. Like the, uh, you know, the, and these tools do much more than that, I would just say. But these tools are good jumping off tools if you're looking for automation. Sometimes, though, you want that really fast um, loop, right? You, want the, you don't want to be doing Docker build, Docker push, or, or container runtime of choice. Uh, you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be doing any kind of um, build and push, even if it's automated. You want to be in that inner loop super fast, right? But you do want to minimize the differences between production and local. This is the tricky thing. You want high fidelity, right? We've got production running, looking good. We've got local running, looking not so good, right? We've all been there. I think we can all recognize that one. Um, but just bear this in mind. Uh, really, the last two slides about that trade-off of speed and fidelity. They are really, really important in testing. You're always trading off speed and fidelity. I'm not sure what's going on there. That's not my laptop, I don't think. Help anyone? Don't know. Any, any thoughts? My laptop looks fine. <laughs> Turn off and on the source. Any thoughts, anyone? Oh, we've got someone running. Sorry, everyone. I saw it flicker just a moment ago. Sorry? <laughs> we'll do the turn it off and turn it back on again. Fingers crossed. Oh, magic. Thank you. We it's all good. Got another Microsoft approach, right? Sorry, Microsoft folks. <laughs> Turn it back off. Uh, on. There we go. You got those there. Uh, so, with that context set, trading off the speed, you're trading off fidelity. Bear that in mind. Again, I'll hat tip people like Charity Majors, Cindy Shudharan. They do amazing blog posts on those topics too. Options and trade offs. Um, so, we are going to build up to this slide along the way. Again, Quite a tight time scale, so I'll keep it snappy. But I do want to talk uh, along the top, we've got our mocking, service virtualization, and remote call tooling. Along the side, we've got um, the various types of tests, right? And this inner loop exploration, I'll just give a bit of context on that one. That is where you've been given a service, maybe a spec, 
and you want to poke and prod and figure out what that service does. I call that inner loop exploration. I'm trying to build my mental model of a third party, or maybe even an internal dependency. That's why I don't think mocking it makes sense, because I don't know what it does, right? I can't mock it if I don't know what it does. And I do think things like remote make a lot of sense here, because I can run the thing in, in a cluster and do a remote to local bridge and start poking and prodding the API to actually get feedback as well. So that's the kind of context we're going to build up to. If you want to be grounded more in the tech, show me the tech, right, options. If you're looking for mocks, I come from a Java world, Mockito, Paramock, uh, Jest for JavaScript, Go Mock for Go. If you're uh, looking for service virtualization tooling, uh, love test containers, local stack. I was a big fan of that when it came out of Atlassian uh, many years ago for embedding uh, AWS components in your test runners. And I've also run things like H2, HSQL, uh, embedded Kafka, uh, when I'm running stuff uh, like I want to simulate something rather than run the real middleware, real data store uh, in my tests. There is a Microx, Hoverfly, Wiremock, and Mountie Bank, more um, network level uh, virtualization tooling. I'll cover that more in a moment. Uh, they're great tools as well. Check them out. And the final category, local tooling, I put two um, splits, DevSpace, Octeto, Scaffold, Tilt, Telepresence, Miradi, and Gafaya. That is your full list. Uh, I want, they're all open source, as far as I know. Uh, there may be companies behind them, but they're open source tooling. Uh, I have put in bold the CNCF Sandbox projects. Microx, uh, DevSpace, Telepresence, and in blue are the tools I have worked on. Own my bias, right? I worked on Hoverfly about 10 years ago, still going, and I worked on Telepresence, part of the community still, but I left Ambassador Labs about a year ago, where I was, before that, I was working on it quite a lot. So, with the tech in mind, let's have a look at some mocks. So, hopefully, this, you know, app dev audience, I'm going to go pretty fast on this. This is the kind of thing I'm thinking of mocks, right? I can verify interactions, I can stub uh, data over here at happy days, right? We will just, just the level set what I'm talking about with mocks. There we go. The good with mocks, they are idiomatic. If I know Java and I'm working with a Java mocking framework, the, like, the learning curve's pretty light. Quick and cheap. You saw that, right? Super easy to do verifications, super easy to do stub to calls as well. Love that. And if you are building out a component that you're mocking, there can be a great way to build your mental model, kind of outside in TDD. You're literally prototyping the API, prototyping the interface before you're building out the back end of that uh, component within your application. So I, I've learned a lot sort of it's API design with mocks over the years. The bad, there is implicit assumptions coded in, and I call this the three realities conundrum. You'll recognize it when you, everything works like fine locally, tests pass, puts it to production, something falls over, because there are tests, the mocks, sorry, have drifted away from the actual implementation. And the reason I call it the three realities conundrum is there's always a real world we're trying to model, some business problem. There's always your code you're writing to address that problem. But as soon as you've got a mock in the mix, there are three realities there, right? Not, no longer just two, there are three. And if they get out of sync, you can get confidence locally, but as soon as you push it to prod, stuff falls over. And, and you'll see this a lot with difficulty keeping up to date and sharing and coordinating. I worked on a Ruby on Rails project. We were sharing our mocks as the project went on over the years. And it became highly coupled. And we were like duplicating mocks and falling over each other with different data and the same mock and these kind of things. Just became a nightmare. Uh, there is commercial tooling available to help some of these things. Uh, the final thing, it does need a test runner. I come from the Java world, J unit, but N unit, pick your poison, right? You need to run the mock via a test runner. I can't just stand it up and poke and prod like I can with some of the other tools. I need a test runner. So what to use then? This is what I'm thinking for um, mocks. Love it for uh, unit all the way through to component. End-to-end, -end, I tend not to use mocks in end-to-end. -end. I'd rather use a service virtualization, or I'd rather use a sandbox. Like if I'm testing against the PayPal API, I'd rather use the uh, um, PayPal sandbox than some kind of mock of it, right? Just more realistic. And you can't really use mocks when you're building your mental model with a third-party third thing. Service virtualization. Now, this has been around for a long time. It's definitely more enterprise-y, though, I would say. And this is uh, some code from Hoverfly that I worked on. You can see, probably recognize the kind of vibe, right? Um, you can see I'm setting up a sort of fake mytest.com, putting a um, rest, an rest URL there, so a path. And I'm saying, when I um, hit that uh, endpoint, return some data. 
and I can literally assert that down below, right? I'm just saying, you know, calling this API, asserting it. But notice I'm going over the wire. I am making a request to a synthetic endpoint of mytest.com. That's very different than just calling a mock within your code, right? You can test more of the networking stack. You can introduce failures to deterministically fa uh, see how your uh, application handles those failures. Lots of really powerful stuff with this. Um, and, and why a mock and Mountie Bank do the same kind of thing? The real cool thing with service virtualization is the ability to capture traffic, though, and mess with it, too. So I can literally got service A, service B. I can make a request, put Hoverfly in the middle. I can capture the request and response in a script database and export it as JSON. I can then remove the network connection. So I'm just running locally or I'm running in CI, right, uh, and replay any requests that I made. I can also change the data. I can introduce failures. Really quite powerful. Some example code here. I'm no longer setting up the mock like you saw in the last uh, slide. I'm loading in a JSON file that contains request response pairs. I'm making my um, call I'm over the wire, right? And I'm asserting the values get it back. But I've not pre configured that. That's being loaded in, in that file. Really quite powerful. Got to shout out test containers, right? I love test containers. I've been a fan of the project. Luckily, know the founders. They, one of them was sort of uh, very active in the London Java tech scene. So Rich, I'll shout him out, and Sergey and crew uh, have done amazing work on, on test containers. It, there's a commercial entity behind it called Atomic Jar, which has now been acquired by Docker as well. So the future is bright for test containers. There's plenty of good open source stuff in there. But you can literally run a service or a data store um, within a container. The beauty of test containers is it's super fast, and it manages the life cycle for you uh, within your test runner. So tear up, sorry, set up, tear down, that kind of thing. And you can run a real thing. You can see here I'm, I'm literally putting in some data into a Redis, and I'm asserting on the get back. Like, no need to set up any orchestration. Beauty of, like, test containers, I can literally run the real thing. So service virtualization, the good. It's more realistic than mocks. It can be the real thing, albeit resource constrained. If you're running, uh, like, say, test containers locally, you maybe ha can't have massive databases. You can have a container with a lot of, you know, with MySQL in it, with some data in it. That's no problem. But if you want to do, like, gigs and gigs of data, maybe you want to explore other options. You can do those wire level deterministic failures. This, was, for me, was really powerful in a couple of migration projects I worked on, where we had some kludgy old mainframe system with like, someone had bolted a REST API onto it. Uh, we just couldn't get it to fail on demand, and we couldn't understand how it failed. Um, but what we did is we started mo uh, putting in uh, what's called middleware in Hoverfly that would corrupt packets coming back, mess with the data, stuff that we kind of knew happened, and we could make sure in our code that we were defensive against those kind of practices. So we recorded a request response against the mainframe thing, um, but then we introduced failures in our test suite to make sure we handled that properly. It is easier to use a larger amount of data. If you're mocking and you start writing and you're copy-pasting lots of data lines into your mocks, that's a bad sign. Switch up from that. If you're having to like, do crazy updates to your mocks all the time, again, a bad sign. Maybe service virtualization is a better look. The bad, they are slower, often by an order of magnitude, than mocks to initialize. Like mocks are in process within your test runner, right? These are often add a process calls, so it is a bit slower to initialize. It can be tricky to configure. Hoverfly does have a bit of a learning curve, uh, I think, on that. Uh, and the, keeping the data uh, up to date and shared is tricky. This is where a lot of commercial tooling is, is being built around this space, making sure the data can be shared and version controlled, that kind of thing. So what to use when? With service virtualization, don't really think for unit tests, because it tends to be a bit too slow for unit tests. Integration component end-to-end. -end. Again, if that PayPal sandbox is super flaky or super slow, maybe I record it using Hoverfly uh, WireMock, and I can put that in my end-to-end -end tests. In a loop exploration, maybe. That migration example I gave, we had this you know, endpoint of this legacy system. We recorded, and re um, record, so we recorded the requests and responses, so we could sort of understand a bit more about the service we were developing against as well. So it can be useful in that scenario. A couple of shout outs. My folks are actually in the front row here, hidden away. Um, if you're looking at async API testing, which is been very popular these days, I think like, it's kind of the gold standard in that space. A lot of the tools I've worked on are more REST API based, open API, Swagger, that kind of stuff, right? 
do love what they're doing in the async API space. And not just Microx, a bunch of other tools. I'm going to shout at the Docker folks. There's, in Docker Desktop, there's a series of extensions, plugins, these kind of things. Uh, and you can often get started very easily if you've got Docker Desktop running with one of these extensions. We've got one for Telepresence that I worked on too. And I find it a really nice way to demo and, and play around with the tech. So just a kind of coupon shout outs. And I'm sure you can chat to the folks in the front here, uh, Yasin and, and team, if you want to know more as well. Final um, section, uh, remote call. And I'm not going to dive too much into this. I've got many other longer versions of this talk online where I do live demos. I wasn't brave enough today with 25 minutes to do a live demo that involves the network, right? Um, so uh, check out my demos online. But just no remote tools, remote to local. I think I stole that from the Influx folks. Uh, but remote tools, you can take a uh, application, a service running in a pod, and you can kind of swap it out with your local machine. Oh, I'm too far away, sorry. Uh, you kind of, oh, that was my bad, sorry. Uh, you've got to take a service and you can swap. There we go. And um, swap that service out with your local machine. Uh, and basically, there's a proxy mediating, bridging between the local and the remote. Traffic can go both ways. You can send traffic from your local machine into the cluster, poke and prod services. You can also have traffic routed from the cluster, maybe from the ingress into your services to test your services running on your local machine. Very powerful kind of modality. There's other cool stuff you can do. And imagine I've got a laptop there, but you can also uh, think of that as a CI runner. So the CI runner can like, do a bridge between local to remote. You can have a shared, say, staging environment and swap out the various services when you're testing, which is very cool. Don't worry if like, that something doesn't make sense. Like I say, there is, I'll put some links up in a minute where some folks have actually talked at KubeCon about how they use remote tools. But the reason I like these in this kind of testing concepts, sorry, testing context, is they allow me to reach into the cluster and test with the real thing. That's the big thing with remote. At remote to local, it gives you that. So for the good, it enables testing against and poking of the real thing. You literally put your local machine effectively into the remote cluster. You can run various tests as if your machine was in the cluster. Very powerful. Data sets can be large scale. When I was working on telepresence, we saw a lot of use cases with machine learning. Massive databases running in a Kubernetes cluster, they could never hope to bring down locally. So they'd use telepresence to bridge from their local machine to remote, run their tests, disconnect. Right? That was a real powerful use case. There is no need to build that mental model of a dependency. You can literally you know, connect up to the cluster, start calling the APIs with Postman, with the CLI, whatever works for you. The bad, you do need a solid network connection. Mutating shared state, as with most of our lives as developers, is the bane of existence, right? So if, imagine if you're sharing that staging environment, but you're modifying the shared state, you might break someone else's tests. That happens all the time, right? So just bear that in mind. With great responsibility, or is it, you know, great freedom comes responsibility. There is a lack of language bindings. Like mocks clearly are idiomatic to your language. Um, service virtualization tools have SDKs, like typically for all the main languages. Uh, a lot of the uh, remote tools do not yet have um, language bindings. Um, I know some of like the, I think I saw the metalware folks in the, in the back as well. They're doing some stuff with Mira D, which I think kind of gets rid of some of that, uh, need for some of that stuff as well. But just bear that in mind if like your developers, your teams, you want a language binding, want an SDK, some of these tools don't offer that. Uh, quick shout out, the, uh, it was Razorpay folks. They're like a unicorn over in India, fantastic tech team. Uh, chatted them a few times, did a talk where they compared using dev space and telepresence for testing uh, large scale services. They've got you know, Razorpay, it's like a PayPal type vibe, right? Massive scale, super interesting use case. Sooner the Vencat did an amazing talk during COVID times. Check that out. And if you want to know more about telepresence running that in GitHub Actions, got your link there as well. So what to use when? This is what I think for a remote call. Unit tests, no. Like, unless you've got a special use case where you are that um, massive like, data engineering, machine learning kind of scenario, you don't want to be running like, remote call tools, bridging into a cluster, crazy high latency. Then it may be integration testing, but the rest of the tests, really good use case. I'll give a shout out. I did see the. Um, the Mirror D folks, Metal Bear, they're doing a great looking talk. I'm going to go along to it tomorrow that goes into more of these things. If you want to know more about sort of that sort of remote call, uh, vibe I talked about, I think they're going to talk about some of the mechanics behind the scenes, which sounds fascinating. Wrapping up, so we went through what to use when. Hopefully, in this whistle stop tour, and again, there is a longer version of this talk online from various conferences you can check out, or I can give you the links. And um, this is what kind of what my thoughts are. 
I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I would love your feedback on these things. But again, early on in my career, I really valued just signposts of what to use when and what kind of options, or knowing what kind of options are available for me as a developer. Additional content. I've mentioned, I think, Cindy Shaharan already, but like, Cindy's work is fantastic. I've learned a lot from Cindy over the years. I've written some stuff about um, uh, coupling and cohesion with testing that I think stood the test of time. It's about five years old now. Hopefully that's useful for you. And Sam's book and uh, Alex and crew, I've reviewed both of those books. They're amazing authors. Like They, do a, they go a lot more deeper into some of the um, architecture considerations and the testing considerations that we've talked about today. So those are my kind of uh, recommendations. Wrapping up, hopefully you've seen today, you know, the inner dev loop can be painful with microservices and Kubernetes. The more things you've got, the more trouble you're in generally. And there is those inflection points that are the inflection points of around five services, five to 10, and around, say, 50 services. You just need to switch up your tools more often than not. You can't run everything locally. You can't manage the data in mocks. You need different tools. You have options. Part, particularly if you're a tech lead, like, a big part of your thing is knowing your options, right? The CNC landscape does include several useful projects. Check it out, right? I, I'd like to see more in there. I think the CNCF landscape is very, uh, well, maybe I, wouldn't see like, maybe I wouldn't like to see more CNCF tools. There's a lot of tools, right? But I would like to see more testing tools, because I think these are really important to the development uh, lifecycle, to developer experience. And lastly, MetaPoint, choose your dev test approach wisely. Too many times as a consultant, I rock up to companies and they've just kind of fallen into the tools they've used and fallen into the testing approach they use. And I get it, I've been there, right? But if you can choose your tooling intentionally and document why you're doing what, that is just amazing for onboarding, amazing for longevity of the project. At that point, I think bang on time, I'll say thank you very much. Haven't got time for questions, but I'm around the conference for the next three or four days. Come and find me. You can also hit me up, hopefully, on email or um, on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn as well. Thanks for your time.